actually just spend the day with us and chit chat and talk about the RAF. Now when Joe gets here, he's going to, uh, I just shelled this all together with tape just to see how it would look, how it's going to shape up. And I'm sure he's going to put the final touch on everything. I'm sure the next, the next time we see this, it'll be camouflage and he'll be ready to go. <clears throat> I just want to mention a couple of things on the beginning of this video. Never buy pens at Staples. Keith Ferguson, one of my good friends, who, by the way, is building a Strega and has a whole bunch of Strega videos, mentioned to me something that I thought was significant enough to put on this video. He says, you know, Wendy, I watch all these tapes, and the biggest thing I got out of all watching all of the tapes, the biggest single thing was the sequence of doing things. And I think he was being very honest in a very helpful way by saying this, that... He, from time to time, would go and build a plane, and he'd have uh, the wing done and not know whether to start the tail or start the body and not have the tail finished. Or it, He said the biggest thing he got out of watching all of the tapes was the way, the sequence that I use. Now, certainly, I don't have uh, the only sequence in the world that works. I'm sure other people have an alternate sequences. But my method of bringing everything up to silver, wing and tail, do you love these pens? I can't believe these junky damn pens. Hey, while I'm here, I may as well, whoop, I'll try this pen from, uh, from John English. Believe it or not, it doesn't work. This is hard to believe. Hang on, I'll get another pen. All right, anyway, sorry about the pens. Bringing everything up to silver, the wing and a tail. Then doing the fuselage, and I'm just gonna go through this real quick. But we're at the point right now that things are things are going to start to happen in a hurry. I call it the, the, the happiest time in a modeler's life. In the next week, maybe two weeks, depending on my health, depending on a lot of things besides that, we are going to make an airplane from component parts. We have the wing, we have the tail, we have the fuse. And how we're going to go about doing this, and we've done this on other videos. This won't be the first time I've ever done it on video, but... I think most people find this to be the most, I guess, challenging part of getting a model to fly well put together. This is the part of it that a lot of people just don't have a headlock on. A lot of people can get the wing and tail up to silver. A lot of people can build a real nice body and carve or mold the blocks. A lot of people can do all of these things, but when it comes time to assemble a plane, they get, this gets them in trouble. And, I'll ju and I'm going to run through a, just a couple of quick examples of things that have gotten me in trouble in the past. I'm not trying to say that this is the only way you can put a model together, but this is certainly a way, if you go look at the wall or look around the country, actually, and see how many models I've put together using this method, it works well. It, it's a good way, and it's a basic way that I think everybody that has a straight, flat workbench can make this work for them. Every single thing that happens when you assemble a model has to reference off some reference point. In the case that I'm using, the reference point is the top of the fuselage. And I'm only going to sketch this in in the most basic way. So it's very simple. But it's this line that, and this would be the turtle deck of course, this line that the top of the fuselage sides is what I use for a reference point. That reference point, every single thing that I'm going to do assembling the model is going to reference off of that top of that fuselage side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and put this on the table upside down. I'm then going to, I have the wing, I'm then going to do this in a very methodical way. I'm going to measure up from the table and make sure that I have a center line here and that that center line references off of my table. And no matter how you assemble, I guess one of the things except for finishing that I get asked 
the most about to to please loan me a video on how you put the wing in a tail and how do you put how do you put the push rod in and get it neutral well it's all under the thing of assembly this center line which is already on the fuselages should reference off at a table and if it doesn't of course put some IB it'll never be off by more than an IBM card or so get this center line perfect when that center line is perfect CA the fuselage right to the table and what that lets you do you now have a rock solid stable environment to, to set your wing in now we can make those cutouts and those cutouts by the way if you look down from the top they're not only on an angle back they're on an angle this way that's the most efficient way to do it you get the most surface area touching and then when you put your doubler inside you get a lot of extra strength you never want to have Let's put the saw down right down the middle. This is always, almost always going to crack on you. You'll always have a problem with cracking. But given the fact that I know this center line is off of a level table, I then can reference off my whole wing as far out as the table goes. I can reference my little checkpoints. And I always have my little reference tool that, remember, oh, the Wendy's gauge. Walt Russell made me this, and I can vary the height of this just by loosening the screw, and I can get a constant reference off the table. Now, the reason I spend so much time emphasizing this is you can build the whole plane. I don't care how careful you build a perfect wing that has no warps in it. You build everything as light as possible. Oh, it's like an eggshell, and you've got a mirror finish better than Ski Dombrowski's and more inclines than Russ Hunsberger. If you get the wing and the body crooked, you're screwed, and there's nothing you can ever do to fix it. And I'm going to make a good example. It's an example that everybody can relate to. I made a plane called the Arowana one time, and I was laying out the body, and this was back in the heyday when I thought I really knew everything there was to know about modeling. And when I laid it out, what happened is I laid it on the table. I was using that reference line. And I got all done, and for some reason, I measured back here, and it was out by maybe a sixteenth of an inch. I had glued it all together. I had the thing tacked in. It was glued to the table. And I said, oh, shit, I don't want to break that joint on the bottom. i got to cut all that epoxy out, and i got to do this. And I had a, ah, sixteenth of an inch won't matter. So I glued that little saddle back in. And I glued the top block on, and I, w I went out and spent hundreds of hours putting a beautiful finisher on a plane. This plane never flew one level lap in its life. It was up, down. No matter how much nose weight you put in it, you'd pull out of a wing over, up, down, up, down, up, down. So it was right after the Arowana that I became really, really critical to having three things in alignment. And I don't think anybody in the whole world has much of a case for not having things in alignment. I don't know what would be the case. The wing, and if you, even if you're making a profile, the tail, it doesn't matter if it's a flat tail or an aerodynamic tail, and the motor thrust line. If you can get these three things in complete parallel alignment, the odds are real good that if it, even if it's a shitty design, even if the plane is too heavy, even if the motor isn't right up to snuff, any number of things can be wrong. If these three things are in alignment, the odds are pretty good that you're going to be able to salvage this plane and make a usable plane. And it isn't that difficult to do it. The method I'm going to show isn't a really intricate, hard to do thing. The reason I wanted to lay this out ahead of time was I know a lot of people, when I'm shooting video, they look at it, they look at it, and they say, gee, what's he, what did he do next, what did he do next? Well, the object of everything, of putting a model together, is to get the thrust line, the wing thrust line, and this, th this line in, th in perfect alignment. Now, it's also nice if at the same time, your top alignment isn't exactly the same. You have variable motor offset. I think and I try to make it as accurate as possible that I get this alignment real accurate. But I've had models where this is not in good alignment and they still flew well. 
I've had models where the tail, when you looked from the front, the tail was in a little crooked. I don't say that, that you shouldn't get this in alignment, but I've had models that have this misalignment. Tradition, by the way, is misaligned like this. Don Patterson's white plane is misaligned. And they have still flown totally acceptably. But if this is wrong, forget it. And any time you want to prove how important this is, take a profile. And I've done this to the old blue tutor that I had. That blue tutor would make me crazy trying to get it to fly right. And obviously, they cut the wing hole out at the factory. They cut this at the factory. There isn't, and I didn't spend a lot of time even aligning it. I didn't give a shit because I didn't think it was going to matter that much. It's a profile. Well, I had put one engine in, and I had taken out an engine from somebody else that had oversized holes, and I wound up where the engine had a little bit of down thrust. In my wildest dream, this thing flew so bad it was unbelievable. I loosened the bolts, gave it up thrust. It hunted, it did other crazy things. I finally, finally got a flat level table, measured this dimension, and this really was time consuming. I had it jacked up on videotapes and towels and everything. Measured this alignment and all, these two were fine. These were within a 64th of an inch. But then by loosening all the bolts, I got the thrust line real good. And the way I did it, I bolted on a spinner back plate on the engine and then used a triangle off the table. And I found out that engine was off about four degrees up, four degrees down. It was the most cockamamie thing and the bolts were sinking into the plywood. From this day forward, once I got that motor in good alignment and these and checked that all three of these were in alignment, that plane went on to be a very, very serviceable, competitive plane. It was a whole different animal. It was a night and day thing. So from the Arowana and from the Tudor, I can only suggest to you that it take, take an infinite amount of time to line things up. Now on the Spitfire, we've actually designed in one feature that I haven't had on planes in a long time. And let me just make a real drawing here so we can get this on. We're going to try like hell to get this wing in straight, and we're going to hope that the thrust line, because of the way we make a crutch, these two are in the bank. But it doesn't guarantee the alignment of the tail. Even though this is a flat tail, here's what really happens is, I want to have, from this hatch that's in the back, I want to have an adjustment so I can adjust a little more up or a little more down just to compensate if for some reason I have an alignment problem for whatever reason from taking a plane out in the hot sun from doping a plane with too much shrink dope for whatever reason could possibly happen I want to be able to get in there and have the, the push rod have a joint in it that's wrapped with thin copper wire so I can then adjust these two neutrals now I know everybody's probably saying, why don't you use a piece of that solder link? Yeah, I've seen planes crash that have had solder links. Jimmy, for one. Why don't you use one of those threaded couplers and a ball link? Well, I've watched Bobby Barron stuff planes into the ground time after time. Why don't you use clevis ends? Well, Ted Fancher and many other people, Gene Martin, have lost planes even right at the Nats with clevis ends. The reason I want to have this little link in here, I want to... It's, it's the ultimate insurance policy that if the plane turns a little tighter inside or outside, I'll have a fine-tuning effect. I also will be able to get in at my push rod and adjust my controls from 1 to 1, 4 to 5, 9 to 10, or well, 9 to 10 should be up here. But anyway, I, the reason I'm, I'm emphasizing this is to show you how much time and energy I'm putting into just the alignment and then even if the alignment is wrong, to have a, a back door, an escape hatch that I can get out. Because I really, I've put so much time into the Spitfire project, I don't want any chance that this plane will have some, some flaw in the construction of it that I will have to live with. I really want this plane to be the best it possibly can be. Now, one of the advantages, I hope, and this is the end, going to be the end of this little dissertation here. One of the advantages that, just let's just put Wendy and Joe. Because the planes will be very similar, hopefully, they'll both be good, one of the things we hope to achieve is we can try a prop on Wendy's plane. Ooh, that worked good in the wind. We can just make a similar prop for Joe's plane. I can try uh, a quiet muffler. Okay. Whoop. Didn't work. Well, prods are pretty good. It probably isn't going to work on Joe's plane either. 
I can get my ray rudder adjustments real similar. My lead out settings. What I'm saying is every time Joe flies his plane, I hope to gain some trim advantage. Every time I fly to my plane, I hope Joe will get some advantage. And I hope we can exchange technology, information, and, and in the trim process. Now, I've watched Ted Fancher, Dave Fitzgerald do a wonderful job of doing this. They did it at the team trials. They did it at the Nets. They exchange information. I think it's great. What it adds, the dimension it adds for you, though, is if for some reason you, somewhere down the road, build a Spitfire, let's hope that all this information, the prop that worked the best, the muffler that worked the best, the CG location, which is always super critical, the ray rudder setup, all what side lines it flew on, we can all be exchanging information, assuming the planes are pretty much the same, and I'm, that's one of the reasons I've really, really depended on Bob Martens to do an accurate set of plans. The other, the other part of that is, of course, we want to have this published in a magazine, of course. The other reason for that is if next year we want to build a duplicate ship, supposing this is a killer ship, I really want to be able to grab all the information from these first initial prototypes and put it into next year's plane. And one of the things we have considered is doing sea fires, not, not spit fires, sea fires. More on that to come. Anyway, thanks for sitting through a long... Now, today I have a little time and I want to try to carve this up, at least get Joe's carved up so that I have the patterns and everything. The little scoop that goes underneath the nose, and what I've done is I've gone through the book over and over and tried to decide which one of these I want to simulate. Some of them come out ahead of the wing, the later models. You can see the shape on these. And this is kind of the later one, the Seafire one, where it, it has a little bit of a reverse curve like a mouth but I've gone back and forth through the book over and over again and I want to try to since we're doing a fantasy airplane here since we're doing a fantasy airplane we really have a free hand in deciding this scoop would come out in front of the wing the early ones end about at the wing the mark 21 the front view of this scoop and the bottom view so from from having looked at all of this here's a good a simulated view right here. It looks like it comes out a little bit ahead of the wing and it has pretty much a constant curve. So what I'm going to try to do, I'm going to uh, get out the softest, lightest block I can find and cut out two rough blocks. So even if I don't get, if I don't get one finish carved, at least I'll have the blocks the same. So Joe's scoop and mine are the same. All right, so I've decided on trying to simulate this type of this, the Spitfire scoop, and what I want to do is get a block, cut the side view, then get a block, cut this view, and then basically do the rest of the carving by hand. Now what I managed to do is get a, a nice big soft block. In fact, this is one of those, don't tell Brian, I'm using up his wheel pants block or something here. I have this laid out roughly what I think is going to be the side view. Now I want to get the top view shape. And then when I when I finalize this, I want to make a pattern so Bob Martens can get an accurate pattern right on the plans. But I'm looking at the side view here and I'm trying to try and decide if this is too large. Well, it's going to be smaller when I'm done carving it. Now, any time I've tried to simulate something like this, I find that the easiest way to do this, start with a block that's way too big and just keep carving it till it looks the right size. If you start with a block that's too small, you can't make it bigger. So I took this whole block. I'm actually going to cut it in half now because I don't need, I don't need it that well. Actually, I'll get two scoops out of one here. I'm just looking at that. And again, I want to make an accurate pattern for the plans, but most of all, I want to try to get this shape in first and then the top view, which will have the curve in the back. So by having those two views, then I, I've got half of the, the, 
the simulation done and the rest I can carve up by hand. It'll be a lot easier to do it that way. Okay, now I have the side contour cut in and I have the top contour cut in. Now the next thing I want to do is put the curve in the bottom of this so it matches up right up to the bottom block before I do any of the carving. Now I want to take some of the material out here by hand with the gouge. Just get a rough cut just so I have less sanding. But I'll do the final contouring. What I'll do is I'll take the mold that I used for the bottom block, put some sandpaper on top of it, and I'll get a perfect cut a perfect contour. By the way, that's another nice advantage of having a mold. You don't have to use, normally you'd have to use the top block to do that, and that's kind of flimsy. I would have bottom block in this case. I'm just doing this because I don't want to breathe in any more of this dust than I have to, but again, one of the little detail touches that I hope is going to separate this plane from the, uh, you know, the standard run-of-the-mill ironing board stunners that uh, seem to be so popular nowadays, but hey, We'll see. Maybe the Spitfire will turn some of these judges on. You never can tell. Maybe we'll get some British judges. <laughs> we need something, that's for sure. Okay. Now I have that little contour in there. Now the rest I can do, I'll get sandpaper and sand right over the block. Now what I can do, I'll start with a rough piece of sandpaper, hold it right to the block. By the way, one way, if you didn't have a bottom block, you could use a baseball bat. And I hope by sanding this, I'll see if I can get this. Let me turn a bench on. I can just finish this off with a piece of smooth paper here. Let me try to get this grip on this. And I should have a perfect, an absolutely perfect match. And I have the whole contour, the whole match done in one shot. Now what I did, I just took the extra bottom block and I'm trying to look at how I want to simulate that contour. Again, always make it bigger to begin with and shave it down to fit. So now that I have the top contour, the side contour, and roughly what I, roughly now, this is very rough, what I want to have here, it's a question of just carving it in. Now I'm looking at basically at the side view and the front view to see if I've captured the, uh, the rough shape I want, and I'll keep the book I'll keep the book real handy while I'm carving this away. Now, because I have that contour in it, I always want to leave it a little bit bigger than it has to be. Just a little bit bigger, and I can always sand it down right at the end. It's, it's a lot easier to do that than to make it too small and then think, oh, man, and i got to carve the whole thing over again. So, again, I'll take a little bit off, look at it from the views. See, now this scoop is going to have an inlet hole, and then it, it has a piece where it contours in. So I'm trying to work this, again, off the drawing, and just little by little get that contour in, because the scoop will be like a little shovel coming down.
I've got <clears throat> most of the contours in here. I'm trying to trying to just get a radius on everything here with a little dowel, a little arrow shift. But what I want to do is harden up the whole surface now with thin CA. Once I get it where I'm kind of happy with it. Because what I'm anticipating doing is putting this on after the body is fiberglassed. So there'll be fiberglass underneath here and I can hollow this out. But I do want to get the finish on this. I do want to get a a hard edge that I can work off, especially off the front here. I want to do a little hollowing up here to simulate the air intake. Again, I hope these little tips let you go out and carve all kind of fancy cowlings and canopies and whatever. And before I do any hollowing or anything, I want to get coat a thin CA on everything, just to seal it up. This little contour in here, by the way, is relatively difficult, and I used a, an arrow shaft to carve that around. Again, I'll just do one little spot at a time, harden up the whole thing, whoops, and wipe it real quick with thin CA until I have a, sh a shell of thin CA on the whole thing. Then I can really work the contours. I just want to dress off, smooth out that thin CA a little bit. If I have to, I go through in any spots, I'll put a second coat on. Again, these little contours, these little reverse curves are very difficult to get right, but once they're right, well, it'll add a beautiful little dimension to the model. This is one of the parts you could very conveniently just eliminate if you wanted to, but Again, then it wouldn't be a Spitfire. It'd be an ironing board. Somebody out there can get me some nice gold screen or something. We can push all the way to the back and I'll paint inside there flat black. Next step is to harden everything up with CA. Harden it all up and then get a final contour on everything. Kind of an intricate part. <laughs> now, while during construction, we're going to have to get inside here and get sand the filler and sand all the other finishes that go in here to get that really nice smooth look. So what I've done, I've taken a piece of eighth inch wire and just wrapped just enough 220 paper around that I can get right in the corners and get these edges nice. Again, it's that old trick that I think I put on the last video. Just keep wrapping sandpaper on a, a dowel or a wire until you have exactly the contour you need. If you need 10 layers, five layers, it doesn't matter. And this is why you would harden this all up with thin CA, because right here it's paper thin. In fact, you can see right through it, it's so thin. And I'll hollow the, the whole thing out before this actually goes on to the fuse. This will get all totally hollowed out. Now I'm finished with all the contours on this that I really want. I'm just going to mark the bottom of this where the hollow line is. This has got a couple of coats of thin CA. It's nice and hard. Yeah, that's pretty much done. Hope you've picked up some little thoughts and ideas on how to carve something like that. a lot like what's in the drawing for the uh, 
the one that I tried to copy, but of course there's several variations. I just made a little note on the bottom here so I don't forget. Now the deal is of course to glass up the whole nose to beyond where the scoop is so that the glass runs underneath and then put that on. I, and actually you can tissue and finish it and dope it and everything so it's ready to go and then just have to build a little fillet in. I think that'll add a nice little dimension to the old spit. And of course I'll just do the other one off camera. What a thrill. Just to give you a rough idea of how big, in fact I'm going to ask Bob to put on the uh, plans, the original size of the block I started with. You can see how much gets removed away and that's part of the uh, you know, you couldn't start with a real small block. You always, you always can make it smaller. It's just difficult to make it bigger. A good day's work. Two scoops. <laughs> uh, George Eno of Pennsylvania sent these nice pictures in today. I'm sure Damarel's going to love this. Damarel's got almost the, uh, the similar model, that uh, Conquistador del Gilio. These are really old photos. He said the model is 14 years old, and he's won a lot of trophies with it in, uh, in racing and profile scale. Now, I pass all these pictures on to, uh, to Tom Morris, of course, but check this out. This is really a cool model. <laughs> How can you not like a GB? I can't believe it. There's no such thing. GB's forever. George, eat your heart out. All right, Joe is checking out his fuselage here. Why don't you take all the tape off, lay out the parts, and we'll sure thing, Wendy. We'll do a little inspection of it, a little show and tell here to see what's going on. Just pull the tape off. Here's a whole razor blade. Yeah, just... Before you put this onto the body, of course you can hollow it all out. This already has the CA in here. It's nice and mm -hmm. solid. You can, you know, it's not going to dent. I gave this one coat of thin CA, but you want to still tissue it, filler it. You want all the finish on it so it's silver. Then when you put it on, you want to make the CA fill it. It's a perfect fit. You don't even need a... Okay, is there a, uh, a particular position that you feel this should go in? So, the you know, um, mine doesn't end up back here? No, no. An there? inch in front of the wing. One inch. The, 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 the lip of the scoop, I figure, an inch in front of the wing. Okay, that's where it'll be. And, again, with you know, you can look at the side views. Well, see, I don't have any drawing to go by. Well, I'm so. going to give you the drawings before you go. And Bob Martens... Oh, did he uh, send the... Uh... I have a pattern for everything here. Okay. Nothing left to chance. Take the... Uh, you cut the tape off the tail there so we can take this all apart. <clears throat> when you go to put this assembly on, you notice it's got the pin in the front. Mm -hmm. You want to put it on so that... As a unit, so everything matches right. a good fit there. Now, and and... Even though it doesn't look like it fits real good, it's got to tape in. You see what they, if this doesn't fit just right? Now, wherever, if there's a little space when you go to put it in, put a little piece of 30-second wood in there. Okay, now when you take this apart... Key thing then is to have it... Uh, right. You want to make sure it fits in with the cowling on. Right. 
Let me just get that. Uh, that was a little bit more for yellow there, so I wanted to show you something. So when you put this, the glass cowls worked out beautiful. Well said. Under a half ounce. Any now, mine I needed a little bit of CA here to kind of fill this in. Just use thick CA and dremel it off. Thick CA, don't use any epoxy. Oh, in other words, to uh, right. depending on what spinner you're going to use. If you use, I took the Red Baron spinner and I, you know, I shaved everything down and blended it right in. Okay, and then after you cut the hole for the exhaust, you can run a piece of carbon. This all has carbon fiber yeah, laminated right in there. It's got an edge of carbon fiber. That's all, you know taken care of. Beautiful. And what the nice thing with this is if you need another one, suppose you want to put a different engine, you want a different hole, boom, we just mold up another one. No problem. It won't be a big deal, you know? So anyway, when you get this on, this, this is kind of an important thing. Okay. Let's turn this okay. down. Let's put this at the end of the table. Oh, no, I can do it this way easier. You see how the two bulkheads line up? when it's assembled. Mm -hmm. That's a key right there. Now you want to make another bulkhead out of maybe 16th plywood. You know, take a piece of paper and get the shape so that that joint is is covered. Now what joint are we talking about? See the joint with this? Oh, in other words, apart. Put it, you want to laminate on top of that. Even if it's balsa wood, I end grain, ball, anything, just laminate it because that becomes part of the nose structure. Okay, so you, in other words, we're talking about tying this bulkhead. Okay, I even in. wrote on it so you wouldn't forget or whatever. Okay. Yeah, that's going to be nice. Be, mm -hmm. And then this becomes the tubes and this yeah. plywood become part of the structure. Now what I'm going to do too is where this joins together is take 64th plywood, about five pieces, because you want this to become right. a bulkhead. Tie, tie, tie it, it all together as tight okay. as possible. Gotcha. Tie it right in. Now, all of the fits and clearances are on the plus side. So when you laminate this on, you notice how everything sticks out just 64th of an inch? Mm -hmm. Okay, if you squeeze it into position, You've got some sanding. Yeah. So this, you put this on like you do a top block. Exactly. Thin CA, chink, chink, chink. Right. Work from the front to the back. Get no, the no cowling need, on. No need to epoxy. <clears throat> no. How about the top block? Epoxy that on? No. Don't even have to. What, what the main thing is get the cowling yeah. in place. That has to be there. And right. get this all, and then tack it here. And make sure to, that your fit is right. Because if it isn't, you can make a piece of 64 yeah. plywood around here. I think I can do that. What's and this all for? It's just an air bleed. Now, you know there's going to be oil building up in here. Uh, so the puddle will drip right now. The puddle drips out yeah, at the end of the day, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. Now Mike had a plane where he didn't have this hole and it used to build up oil inside the plane wick, yeah. and it wicks into the body. Eventually it's going to wick in at, at some point in time. Oh, so. there will not be any leaks on this. No, no, no. Okay, so, all right. Oh, right, you can take the top I off now. I understand that concept. Take the top off. You have, here's what would be nice. If you put your motor in and make sure it's dressed on the side, then you're going to have to set your clearance. Mm -hmm. And get a true turn, or you know, you've got all different yeah, things, whatever. I can figure that. Out. Now, but then when you go to put the plastic one on, it's a tad too big. It doesn't look bad if the big, if the spinner's a little bit too big, but if it's too small, it really looks shitty. It really tends to look like a horse's ass. So, all of the little cuts up here you want to make. I'm going to give you the video to take too, so you'll have the whole thing that matches. Okay. This this was like a one day thing to fit all the clearance. And if you need to build up on a fiberglass part, thick CA, thick CA. and just grind it right in. Okay. Just don't use any of that damn epoxalite. Wow. Christmas time, unwrapping. Yeah, Christmas unwrapping present. your Christmas present. That red, that rudder shape meet your. Uh, oh yes. High crate, boy. Was I spent a whole day fooling well, out that rudder. Well, see the thing that. It you know, to make it has it, that bump in it's front. Got it's got it. the point in it. In the. Dimensions are... But it isn't. The other way, it had 22 inches yeah, of side area. I said, oh, man, is it going to weather vane? Remember how Busso's plane used to weather vane like this? Which that one big, that? that jet thing he had. It would weather vane. Uh, go look at the flushing jet? video. The jet. You tune mean his pipe tune, jet. Oh, his tune pipe? Oh, that thing was a weather vane. Yeah. Now, this, what I would do here, you see, this is sealed with... Even if you forget to seal it. Mm -hmm. After you get the top lock on for real, is get some epoxy. Hit it with a hair dryer and get in there and brush it all up in there. Yeah. This is a complete joint right, here. So that has to be no. right. Okay. Now exactly. when, when this top piece goes on, should that be epoxy or should that be the CA? What you I do, do is the nose and this epoxy? part here with epoxy. Okay. Watch. CA all the way. This whole thing and then paint it. 
paint in here, because this is where you can't get once this is on. Mm -hmm. And let this dry. Tape it down. Now when it's dry, now you can start the CA and work for the back. Now there, would, there wouldn't be any value in, in... No, you'd just be adding no. the weight that you don't need. No. And when it's all done, if you want to right. booch some of this out, you could, yeah. it really wouldn't matter. Okay. You're under 10 ounces. The whole body's under 10. So, I mean, you're not, you're not even close to being overweight here. Yeah, very interesting. Molding. Molded, molded wings. Let molded. me tell you, if you go home and screw this top block up, suppose, suppose you sit on it in a car, there's six more of them over there. <laughs> That's the nice part. Or if you're going to do a Spitfire next year, that's done. You could make one of these now so fast. Well, even if it's not another Spitfire, well, like you could use basic, this. like your base exactly. generic fuse box. Exactly. And you then, could then you can make it look like a Yak 9. You could make a Spitfire with a PM wing and tail. Or you could make it look like a, you know, yeah. was another yeah. Stuntress. Doesn't matter. All right, you could pull the top off. The rudder, the rudder has the horn. Now, I figured out the geometry for this. The horn can't be up here because we wanted to have an inch and a quarter. We, right. we are not going to have it. I measured out all the clearance. This is even going to hit. You're probably going to have to grind some after assembly. I figured on the third hole, mm -hmm. and this is just extra, which when you put it together, you grind it out. But what's going to happen is because the horn is off center, it's just the same thing as making it longer. In other words, if you put the horn back here, the further back it is. And I, in my intricate calculation, I went, eh, eh, eh. You know? Okay. Greenaway would puke if he knew how I did that. One, two, Jim, three, four, four, figure it out for me. Okay, so yeah, the hinges, I don't have any half-A okay, hinges, I'll but they're all cut. Can, can and you do don't cut the hinge slots for here until this is glued. Oh, yeah, because yeah, what's yeah. going to happen is you're going to have to sand it. This skull gets pinched. Yeah. Mm -hmm. gotcha. And get it, the last sanding, you want this all to match. So all that, you this will all come down a quarter inch. It's all going to be at the, see at the block right, at the very end? In, right, right. Okay. it'll be perfect right at the very end. I'd like to see anybody carve a top block like that. I know I couldn't. Oh, there's no way. I made uh, enough cardinal top blocks, it's impossible to do it. Even when you have good wood. When you have four pound wood, you can And what were you saying about, you know, 20, 30 bucks or bucks for a good top block? 40. You, Jimmy paid 40. Yeah, and no, they were good, but he paid 40 yeah, bucks. Yeah, most of it ends up, this is where yeah. we go. You want another top block? We can have one in uh, right after coffee. Hey, I'm no. learning. Next airplane, Boom, I don't know how it's going to be. Done. Well, the next airplane is going to use all the, most of these body parts. I mean, the, the sides, this, the crush. Generic. The, generic. And just change the rudder. Like the Ford Taurus and the, exactly. the Mercury, whatever. Exactly. So, okay. Oh, look at that. Now, this is three laminates of 30-second wood. You can see the laminate. It's a laminated piece. First, okay. they're molded, okay. and then they're joined with epoxy. So this piece here, the nice thing is, yeah. it launches your play, nothing big. And Real heavy, huh? Six grains. <laughs> Beautiful. It's great. Yeah, it really but is a nice. Ball supply. Ball supply. Mm -hmm. And the joint, see, because you can't make it out of three, the joint goes right down the spine, so there's extra epoxy right down the yeah. spine. And, uh, we'll so that's good. Okay. I'll do there's one. paper. There's paper over there on my desk. I'm trying to give Joe all a little little things that I think are important. I want to put a couple of pieces across here, just, you know, quarter inch square, whatever, after the push rod is in and then X them. And it's not really important where you pick, I'd say every third or fourth former, but then you have a complete tube right up there where the, where the, uh, the push rod can go. Eighth inch uh, cross brace, how wide? How Eighth by quarter. Eighth by quarter is plenty. Yeah, I guess you can hear, I still have my beautiful cold. And then cross brace with what, eighth by quarter? Eighth by quarter, yeah. You just strip some off. Where you have, Joe, where the arrow shaft ends, look, assuming this is going to come through here, where the arrow shaft ends, as soon as it ends, you're going to have a one inch piece of wire, and on the end of it, maybe another quarter of an inch. You're not going to be off a quarter of an inch, but that one inch, the wire will be double. There's no place the wire will be single, it'll be double. From the end of the arrow shaft to the but what, end. But what if you got to slip it and the wire gets in the way? Eventually. You, you leave a quarter of an inch on one side. You don't need it. Yeah. All right. All right. If you were to look at this. All right. So I know I want a one inch In here. scale, this is going to look like this. With a quarter of an inch here, a quarter of an inch here. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Now, and if you have to move this more than a quarter oh, of an well, inch, I cut understand. it off and All put right. a new piece of wire in. 
but never use that copper tubing or those slip joints. Those damn things break. All right, so we want it the short, shortest it can be. You don't want a long thing that could vibrate. No, no, no an inch. Thing. An inch is fine. That's right. perfect. And I'm going to leave all the controls to start with that one to one. So when you put the initial hook up, put it at one to one. One to one with right. the what the bottom. Look how nice this hatch fits in there. A little tongue and groove. Pops right in. Now, I don't know until I put the plane together if I'm going to want a glass around here. Because I want to put the tail on and see how rigid it is. That's plywood mm -hmm. inside. If it isn't, I'll just put glass, say, like you do around gear right. block covers. Okay. Right? Aluminum screw from Frank McMillan. You get these little aluminum screws from Microfasten. You know. Yeah, I have a catalog. The, get, yeah, you know, with the little, the little hole. Yes. Buff it out, sand yes, it out. Yes, I mean, yes, that's perfect. And that, if you start at one to one, that'll give you all the clearance down the bottom. And then if we have to, we'll adjust it up. But don't start at four to five or nine to ten. All right. Now, how about as far as this is on the opposite side of the exhaust? So yeah, you're not going to. It's not going to collect. You wipe the plane off every day, every couple times you fly it anyway. Okay. I mean, if you if you're a guy that never wipes the plane off, it's different. If you never wipe the plane off, put scotch tape over it. Or you can do. Yeah, that's true. That's. The only way this would not work is on a, on a like if you had a pipe plane, because this back end of the thing always gets full of oil. On a, on a normal plane, the oil goes all over the place. Marine, you know, they, they started yeah. out life as uh, amphibian equipment. Here's yeah, a, Joe's got this, this book, and I'm just going to take a couple of seconds of it. We've accumulated so much literature on from Supermarine, and uh, it's... But look at this. this oh, was, God. This is the plane that... I, this is that, that see, Schneider that, this, this was the first... Uh, the S4 twin float cantilever. Yeah. This was the first one, the 1925 races. This is what he made the Tucker Special with, for anybody that know, doesn't know. The, uh, the See, rudder that, and everything is from the Tucker Special. But look at the, the way the three bump blister things oh, extremely yeah. straight. Then they, they further refined this into these units. This might be next year's plane, by the way, Joe. I might be thinking about this without the floats. Why not? Anybody out there have any input into this? S4 for next year. Okay, then it evolved into, these were some of the 1931 races unopposed. They just, there was nobody that could beat them. Yeah, they were 100 miles an hour faster than the guy in second place. 407 miles. Nice rudder. This would, hey, Joe, this rudder mm -hmm. would look nice. The canopy, that's what I always liked. Well, it's a Tucker, kind of a Tucker special look. But the, this wing, would the wing's cool. not elliptical, though. It's kind of like. Oh, forget it. <laughs> but, uh, well, we could make it elliptical. Who would know? Okay, now, eventually that airplane developed into... Um, this was one of Reginald Mitchell's first designs with an inverted gull wing, mm. big wheel spats. Mm. Look a little bit like a Corsair or Stuka. Yeah. Kind of yeah. But then this was a, this is the Hawker Hurricane. But what I was looking at were these prototype exhaust ports. Let's get them real close. Okay. We're still working on still our working. finalizing hey, 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 this, our Karen's out shopping for macaroni. We, we haven't given up on elbow macaroni yet. When I looked at this, Wendy, I said, well, oh. this, was, yes. this was the prototype Spitfire, but if you notice the exhaust port, there's like a bump or a blister, yep. a very shallow blister, and it just has these little open ports. So it it is, but it isn't. It's not an exaggerated exhaust stack, but it, it looks pretty streamlined and smooth to me. That, to me, is a doable, workable thing. Even if you... You had these elongated exhaust stacks in there that were little aluminum tubes that you cleaned off, you know, flush, but it still had that very shallow blister. This and one's then, got a skid. What the hell is yeah, this? Yeah, well, that was a prototype. That's a prototype. The one that had the skid. And then, wow. And then that prototype airplane was then refitted in military, what they call in war paint. They put a tailwheel on it. And, but this, awesome. that, this, yeah, this scoop. Yeah. Is that, did we get that it looks scoop? looks familiar. Right? But on a drawing, it looks like this comes a little bit ahead of the leading edge, so yeah. we better check that if we go to change it. But that's the thing. Can you pick that up with your naked eye? That's what I'm trying to. That that little blip. That yeah, it's little, just a blip. I just know. a blip that leaves a you know has a little mounded, rounded off end, but has those exhaust stacks coming. Okay, now here was a variant that I was telling you about, and this is this is the one that I could picture flying into Flushing Meadow. And this is back in 1944 where they wanted to give some comforts to the troops. And this is a Spitfire Mark 9. And it was armed with two 18 gallon beer barrels. Root to the troops. <laughs> Greenway like this one. Greenway, one for Borelli and one for Macluso. <laughs> okay.
the Glenn Metter Spitfire. <laughs> but now that's an interesting variant. You could take wow. the air scoops off and you could put beer barrels under it. Jesus. Yeah, Macaluso would go for this. Yeah. I can see this. The Macaluso. Yeah, you know, maybe Spitfire. if it just had, maybe instead of being a barrel, it'd be like one 12 ounce can, <laughs> Budweiser or Coors Light or whatever. <laughs> the Joe Ortiz Spitfire. <laughs> But that would be oh, different. Oh, what bastards we are. Oh, here, here's oh, look at this one back. Let me see the prop. Oh, my God, I love this stuff. Now, that's the exhaust I like. These yeah. And look at the scoop, Joe. Oh, man. I haven't given up on the idea of having cannons, either. You can tell we're losing our mind yeah. here. Share, share the insanity of Spitfire. Here, look at the development. Uh, oh, check, check this out. This is... You know, I was talking earlier about that high-speed version. Yeah. Here's one that was... It's not color, but high speed. It had like a lightning bolt coming down the side. Yeah, this is yeah. the one that was painted that duck egg blue. There's a recon version? A reconnaissance version. Strict, all stripped out, ready for... Oh, my God. Beautiful. But not in color. Now, here's one. This is what happens. In stunt, when you run out of gas, you just land it. But this guy ran out of gas with his Spitfire 1, landed in some... Um, wheat field or whatever it was, cornfield. Yeah. In order to get it back to a place they had a frogging ham or something. <laughs> they had to tie ropes to it and, <laughs> and pull it up a highway. But oh, isn't God. Isn't that a great picture, though? Jeez. And out of all the books I've seen, I, I just haven't seen these kind. Of, these are pretty rare, different kind of. Yeah. Uh, Imagine pulling this thing up the BQE to Flushing Meadow. This would be great. Oh, my God. And this picture I've seen in other publications. And, uh, here, look at this one. Oh, I love this. Right here, the, the, uh, the ca caption one. on this is, what German bomber crews hope never to see, a Spitfire curving in for a stern attack. This is one with one radiator, by the way. Some of them had one well, radiator. Well, that was the early, the Spitfire ones. I guess as they made more and more power, they need more and more cooling. Well, see something else. These three stack exhausts, they were actually, they crimped the, the exhaust yeah, they put two out, into one. Yeah. And they were trying to get a little jet boost or use the actual exhaust pressure to increase speed. And also at the same time to not blind these uh, pilots if they were flying at night. Yeah, you know, at night, flames are coming out of these, boy. Well, foot wall. There's some, uh, again, formation flying. I love this. F Z L G P D D D. Mm -hmm. I, I want to use some something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's got to be Ad Musco or uh, Midge Lee or something. Or, you know, we'll, maybe we can figure that out. Gerald Champ. Yeah, here's a little cockpit detail. Yeah. Close up. You can see that kind of bulkhead behind the pilot seat. And well, this will be on our models. This will be. And a uh, headrest. Uh, I've already got this in my mind. Now, I brought some other detailed things to look at also. We'll be doing cockpits, that's for sure. And this was all the Dunkirk. Uh... Yeah, that's strange. I've never seen mm -hmm. that before. Joe's pointing out the roundel is way out on the tip here for some reason. So many variations, so many variants. And then even the wheels. Well, I show you some pictures of wheels. And then even look at another picture unusual with the roundel so far out to the tip like that. I never saw it. That's the first one I've ever seen like that. And then look at the radiator. It has a dump uh, gate. Yeah, the dump gate drum. at the back of the radiator, yeah. And then the wheel pants. Uh, awesome. Now, this is what, the high altitude high version? High altitude. Uh, with the real high pointy. Holy mackerel. Let's see, here's our, here's our rudder shape, Wendy, right here on this uh, Mark 8. On this page, see? There's the rudder shape. Oh, yes. Yes. Pointy points. Yes. So we got a little bit of everything in here. And there's the scoop. Hey, mm -hmm. eat your heart out, Mitchell. See how they're just like smooth hubbed? Yeah, well, these are the ones they made for the desert with the smooth yeah, wheels. So they're hey, bigger than standard wheels, I'll bet you. So you and a big get, giant air so scoop. So you wouldn't get sand in your disc brakes yeah. or drums or well, whatever, whatever they were yeah. running, sure. Now, what was the idea of this? Uh, better handling at low altitude. Better. Clipped wing tip. It's ugly, though. I don't like it. Yeah. I but like the, the, the Spitfire wings. can never roll correctly. But what this photo is actually showing are these belly tanks for, you know, extended uh, range yeah, and yeah. so forth. The four-spoke wheel. Now, what is this? This is a Mark 8. Mark it has 8. that pointy rudder. It's a Mark 8. 
And these are four-spoke wheels. Well, we better get four-spoke wheels then. <laughs> we better get something, get hamburgers. Mm. Beautiful book. By the way, thanks to everybody that's contributed books. Who we dug during yeah, there's, there's a Polish squadron that had the... Uh... Oh yeah, Polish. the Polish Air Force yeah. with the Spitfires, yeah. And they had the nice ones with four And they also props, they had too. a Czech squadron too. So you know, you're Polish, I'm Czech. Yeah. Here's a five-spoke wheel. This is a Mark IX Spitfire. 1943. Approximately, you can see the pointy things, but the next page shows some more, you know, bland, generic kind of. But, you know, it's a base to, to put things on, like invasion stripes. Or invasion. Now, this version was all light blue, duck egg blue. Duck egg blue, they called it. But it's going to ruin the model. If you're making a scale model, you could do that, but not on a stun ship. Okay, and this was a U.S. Air Force photo reconnaissance version here. You know, with the ball and star, or bar and star, mm. as they call it. Looking at the scoop here, he's got the right scoop right here. Probably aluminum. That is an American version. It has the Mark 8 rudder. And the star and bar. And the rudder is probably painted red or something like that. Poor four spoke wheel. Look at this, you got four of these rudders in a row. And Mark four eights. scoops in a row. Mark 8s. That's the hot thing here, Mark 8s. But these were... Four-bladed props. Now, you're going to get some Bali four-bladed props for us, or what? We definitely got to have four-bladed props. These are props. Australian Spitfires. But, uh, you know, they had a lot more side area, I guess, to... Yeah, to counteract the torque. See, this is the kind of roundels I like, these big, giant... Yeah, they're you, right up on the leading edge. Wait till you see what I brought after we get to Roundels, rudders, spits on floats. Amazing when you do the research on some of this stuff. It's so interesting. It's unbelievable. And you would unless you watch wings, you would have no way of knowing any of this stuff even exists. See, here's something else too. See that round bell and then a round circle with Yeah, the, well, well, instead of a P, mean, we yeah. gotta put well, like Adam just, Usko just or something the in there. They're pro stunt products. That's right. Yeah. Pro, <laughs> pro, pro stunt. Pretty nice. Look oh yeah, just another day at Middlesex. All the guys lined up to take a flight. Here's Dave Cook. There's Midgley. Damarell on crutches. Oh man. Yeah. Let's see the next page. And that was probably an all like gray or sea green or gray or whatever it is, but um, Yeah, yeah, like a navy version. But you know, you can put your name on there, your AMA number. You can do all kinds of trick things. Mark twenty one wing shape, which was an elliptical. Now this had the Griffin engine in it. Look at the scoop on this one, the Griffin and the counter rotating three blades. I don't like those wingtips as much as the Mark Eight. The Mark 8 is the nicest one, that's for sure. Look at this, though. I mean, tell me this isn't doesn't get your blood boiling. See, this had gear doors on it. See the flaps hanging down? Yeah, Clean yeah. it up for better speed performance. Look at the flaps dropped, how they Oh, yeah. Drop down this is gear. a carrier. This is a carrier shot, by the way. The guy's already on the hook. Amazing. The Spitfires. And it says here, the caption, in these superb air-to-air -air shots, Mark 24 is flanked by a Mark 21 and a Mark 22. So, hmm? Yeah, if you're going to do a bubble canopy version, this but would that have been a nice But that was a Mark one. 22. It didn't have the elliptical wing, but still, yeah, you can see the... the it has almost the, the same lines. scoop as we just got done making. Boy, this book is unbelievable. Who gave you this book? My mother-in-law. Wow. So you know I was in the Spitfires. Now, how many people you think out there know that Israel had Spitfires? Not many, right? So you know stuff through these beautiful videos that the average person on the street and this was in doesn't have a clue. 1948. Look at that ball with the yeah. Prize David Star David, I guess you'd call it. Yeah, yeah. If you if you knew that was going to be uh, one of the models you choose, sure. Like the F-16 had an Israeli version. 
I'm sure they had some camo for that. Let's see what's on the next page. And that's a C5 Mark 15. This is for the Burma Air Force. Look at so the many variations. Look at the rudder shape, though. Look at the scoop. <laughs> so you got our rudder? Mm hmm. All right. Nice canopy. Midgley, these canopies better be awesome when you're done with them. They're here they will answer. be. The Irish Air Force. Irish Air Corps. Who the hell's the Irish Air Force down here? Yeah. See the emblem on the side? It looks like a, a comma, but I guess it's. Yeah, a... yeah. Well, they started making roundels, but probably everybody was drunk. They're in a bar drinking or something. And actually, those are nice emblems. Here's this is the pilot, the training version with two canopies. Yeah. See, they didn't have to carry their beer under the wing. <laughs> <laughs> they drank it before they got into a cot. No, that's the men's room. That's the toilet. Oh, God. That's the restroom. Oh, that's an Egyptian God. Air Force unit. King Tut's Air Force, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. 1950. An insignia. Now, this is what, the Netherlands Air Force? Royal Netherlands Air Force. Man. Everybody had Spitfires except us, huh? Jeez. Well, no, but not. Well, the Americans had Here's some. one that's a Swedish. Now, see, if you were going to the team trials in Sweden this year. Right, you make the Swedish version. You make version. the Swedish right. Spitfire. Right, and you vote for all the Swedish judges on F2B. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, look at this. Beautiful. But this is a Mark 14. Elliptical clip wing. It's be better. And your mother-in-law got you this work. This is probably yeah. one of the best. Let me see the side of this again. Okay, everybody, my birthday's coming up on uh, August the 16th. <laughs> Buy me Spitfire books. Okay, you ready to go? You got more oh, stuff. Oh, more, more, oh, more my Spitfire God. Stuff. More. We need more Spitfire stuff. Okay, here's more uh, stuff. Spinners, I've got another half dozen coming, but okay. I'll, I'll give you one to another one of the... Another one to grind up this the This is what's a, a two and a half, but it measures two and three eighths, so you figure it out. But probably yeah. because there's no back plate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, the removable nose cone, this plug can be made out of hard balsa, and it could be rounded off to where you get the right contour. Yeah. This plug could be made like you're worried about adding nose weight. You can make it out of lead if you want it. I mean, there's all kinds of ways of putting nose weight in these things. But here, that's another one for you to... By the way, anybody doesn't know, you could turn the spinner upside down and fill it with epoxy, too, if you want to be a crazy man. Here's wheels. Oh, look at these wheels he's got. This is, uh... Did you make my gear doors up? Well, that's what they... I'm, you know, that's what they're going to look like. But uh, he, these are those aluminum mag wheel deals, and they have the foam rubber that you can peel off and... Look at these wheels. But just an option, but what's nice about this is a nice nylon bushing. And if you look spin at that. I can't spin it with my hand there. Yeah, that's nice. It's bushed. Nice and quiet, too. And uh, you, know, you know what I always hated about your plane? When we launch your plane and you got to go pick it up, it lands and it's quiet. The wheels, you don't even hear them turn. And you just hear that. You don't like that? No, on mine, when you land, it sounds like there's cracker jacks falling out of the hinges or something. The wheels okay, are always so worn out you on know, my you, plane. You can evaluate those wheels. Yeah. Right here's the two and a quarter. Here's some two and a quarter. Okay. Kind of scale looking. I guess you put them on that way, it would look like a desert version. These never use, by the way. Well, I'll, let me tell you why. Okay. I had these on a plane. When you go to pull on a handle, this is like ice skating. Yeah. Okay. And plus, in 10 flights, they wear out. But that, They're scale. Just use them for show or something. Yeah. But These look great. These, I love these. They're half ounce each. Uh, well, we don't care about the weight on that. We're, we're plenty under the weight limit. Here. But, you know, it depends on what you're... Worry about the weight. The guy's got a nine and a half ounce body here. Well, you know, leave leave his stuff with you to look at it. Yeah, there. put it all in one bag. We'll check okay. it out. Check it out. Now, what size do these come in? These are two and a quarter. Two and a quarter. They come two inch, and then they're bigger than that. And these are what the radio control pattern guys use. I would be thinking you need at least two and a quarter. This is two and a quarter. Yeah, minimum. I mean, you don't want to yeah. go get no little tiny goddamn wheels that you but can't lay in really grass. Really, really a nice hub. Mm. Okay. We we're looking for a practical fighter here, yeah, all weather fighter. So not the well, I can't this fly was a spare gear from Mr. Awesome, so it's not the okay. Right but you can snap that in your wing and kind of look yeah. at that. And, you know. Okay, great, so, great. And I've got <clears throat> now the reason we're doing this all on video is I'm trying to show this is something that I had written up like an outline of what we were going to try to write. 
And then Joe went and expounded on it and came up with this, which of course is already typed and, and there's a thousand things here, pictures and whatever. But how much work actually goes into writing an article? A lot of people think, oh, you just sit down on a toilet some night and write an article. Well, not this one. This article is gonna is probably gonna have a hundred hours of writing time in it, so we won't put it on video, but we are spending time. I know one of the things Joe has, we're going to try to lay it out. He came up with this idea for doing roundels using a compass and a number 11 blade to cut the roundels. Uh, unfortunately, the only compass I have is too small, so we're just cutting one out. Let's see how this looks. Okay. Put it out on there just so we see what Just this to is. give you an idea of how the. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The bigger, the better. Where's that other thing that I brought? What do you need? Yeah, that's what I had in mind. Is a nice. Okay, but that position. Let's just see. See, because what happens? You have a, you do have a bend in it. Yeah, but see, this is not going to be your pattern. Your pattern is going to be. The, see, the, the outside. The sheet was yeah, the whole yeah, yeah. Okay. So it, uh, believe me, it. Uh, it and goes, you did these already? You tested them and they lay down. Yeah, those? they tested and I sprayed okay. them. And I, of course, the only problem was that old wing had emeron. So that you yeah, were yeah. The, the paint didn't dig in. I was looking yeah. for that alignment. Yeah, but nice big unit. Yeah, well, you make an alignment off of this line and off of the leading or edge. Or whatever it is, you know. That's no problem. Uh, so the way it looks here is, you know, there will be some. Yeah, let me just take that minute to dig out. This. When you're in a when you're in a silk span bay and you want to do a straight line, though, you got to it's got to have that little bit of a curve in it. That's the deal. All right, lay that on top of that. So you know what I did is I had the trailing yeah. this thing here. So this would yeah. see what Joe has is the, the whole the full size shape of the line, and it positions the round L. Hey, you know what you could do is use contact paper, cut out yeah. the outline of the wing, and use the outline of the wing for reference. Yeah. But at any rate, this yeah, is, yeah, that's fine. Just to give you an idea, so the way it ends up is your round L is going to be in there. Or something yeah. Like that. But when you cut the see the reverse of this, the opening. And I tried this, man, it just tacks right down. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of different ways you can do this. You can do yeah. your weight first, red weight, and work outward, or you can uh, Let me give you a good it. suggestion for doing this. You lay out the whole roundel the big way and spray it white. So that the background that are red and blue, you're on a white background. Right, so it'll you, be, keep, you work your way up. It'll be bright, yeah. And white, you can, white, red, blue, or however. No, no, if you're going to have the white outline, you can p take the white outline, or you can put that piece in there and measure it that it's symmetrical, but you leave the white. But the white now is the background for this and for this, so That's that right. the, the step in a paint, you only have one little ditch. That's right. You don't have layer after. You don't want to come up like a, like a wedding cake in the middle. It's an important deal. And I, oh, I, I yeah, learned that yeah. from uh, working over some of yeah, these. Oh, yeah. See, thinking this shit out ahead And then if you try to spray, let's say you do red and you try to spray. Yep. Oh, the yeah, edges. Then you get different colors right. and the things. You want to have this line. You that tape is only on there once. That's right. But that's a good deal. Something to. Uh, oh, you did straggle. You do you like can, straggle you lettering. Line, exactly. You can make a plywood template up, lay that plywood template on there, and then get the circle with an ink line. Now, if it if it didn't cover, you could go make to the next angle. wider yeah, pen. Exactly. Right. So that would fake it in too. Yeah, that's. A but thought. I'm gonna try to hit mine right on a. Oh, you try, but you know the reality is. But see, the only two you really. The fun of doing the pieces on that. Is it joint? The double tissue. Our kind of guy that. Flying these, though. I want to be. No, I know. Super Bowl ring mark. That one I'm. Down at the bottom, like. Forget the wire. Okay. Long way. Yeah. Thing where you can. And the trophy at the circle, and they don't even put. Oh. Building for two. Yeah, this has been. Being pregnant with uh, spit. Being pregnant. Now today will probably be the last day I get to spend doing a little, little detail work because tomorrow, assuming we don't get another giant snowstorm, which that's what they're predicting, I have all my parts laid out and I'm trying to go through all the little details now that I still want to do before I assemble a model. When I assemble a model, I like to allocate one clean day where I have nothing else going on in the shop so I don't have any distractions. I have the cowling pretty well set in. Most of the silver stuff good, except for a few little spots on the wings and flaps. Uh, blocks ready, the wheels kind of uh, ready to make the legs up. Uh, one other thing, I wanted to sand out if I could. I wanted to sand out, get that R off, that yellow paint off that Mike was using for a test on the radiators. That's another thing. But try to get, and this is the whole point here. 
At some point in time, I want to have, and I hope that's going to be maybe tomorrow, is have a whole day free and clear to do the assembly. I don't like to do the assembly on a day when I have distractions and, uh, you know, the wife home and wanting me to do things for and mow the grass or shovel the snow or whatever. I like to have a whole free day clear. So that's what I'm working up till today. All little details that I can get done. Now this is one of the things I want to do today. This is this goes into the the category of little details. I want to hollow this out as much as possible. Put a little bit of finish on this and I can bring this up to silver in fact as a separate piece because I want to have the glass going right through the bottom when I actually assemble this. I have the radiators. Again, Mike Rogers was using these for a test. I have to put the hard points in the wing. Again, trying to get a day, a free day. This is the whole object of doing this. It's very, very difficult for me to allocate a whole day. I'm going to have to check with the machine shop and check with Karen and check with the, check with the weatherman and find out if I can get a whole day in tomorrow of assembly. But I'll, I'll spend the day, and it's really a good investment, getting all these little details done, get these sanded down in another coat of silver, and get this guy... Um, Now the last little bit I have to get out of here with the Dremel tool. I get in here with the Dremel tool, get it sanded out. This thing is getting lighter by the minute. <laughs> anyway, just a point of just, just little details like this that when you combine 15 or 20 things that you've hollowed out to the max, you have the weight for the cockpit and there's no penalty. Which we're trying to add detail but take it away from something that we really don't care about. And having a solid scoop is not one of the things we care about. Remember a while back, Uvi Degner sent in these little Dremel tips that have a little cone on them? Well, this is an excellent place to uh, try one out. Well, let's give it a try. Now, this tip really does work well. This is the one Uvi Degner sent in. I'm going to see if I can get some more of these. Check with my hand to see that I have plenty more to go. You really get spoiled when you mold blocks because there's no hollowing. This is probably one of the few parts on a plane that has to get hollowed. Check it with my finger for thickness. And I'll do the final cuts by hand. Make sure I'm not getting too close to the edge of that scoop up there. No, that's fine. This is really a great tool, by the way. I'd suggest everybody that has access to one of these get one. This is really nice. There's really no other tool I know of that I'd be able to get right up there in. Again, all the little details. And this should allow us to put on the things like the radiators and cockpit detail without a real weight penalty. Because what we're trying to get rid of here is dead weight, not weight that's going to hold a motor in a plane or whatever, just dead weight. Now I can finish the hollowing out here with the tube with the sandpaper glued to it. Again, all these little details, it's real easy to overlook details. I know a lot of people that they build a plane, they don't hollow things out properly. Or what happens is they build the whole plane, everything's okay until right at the end, and then they weigh the plane, and they find out it's about two ounces heavier, five ounces than they wanted. Then they wish they could go back and hollow this stuff out. Well, I think it's easier to hollow it out to begin with. I would hate to have to go back in here and do this kind of stuff after the plane is built. Always easier to get the weight out now. You can always make the plane heavier if you want. No, it's 
truly one of the easiest things in the world to lighten up a plane in a way that doesn't make sense. And a way that doesn't make sense would be to just go drill a hole in the motor mount or the gas tank or the glow plug. Some non-productive way. But when you're doing things like getting rid of dead weight, now, to me, the, wo the wood that's inside this scoop, even though it might be a small amount, is an amount that if I take a small amount here, a small amount there, a small amount out of the radiators, small amount out of the cowling, it eventually all adds up. Now that I have, I'm a little bit under the weight I want to be, now I have the choice of adding weight, putting a little extra paint on or whatever. Uh-oh, President Nixon's on the phone. Now you get an idea of just how much I, I've hollowed out of there and sanded out. This is about a 332nd wall thickness all around, kind of a constant thing. It seems like these are a lot of little things and they don't add up or pay off. Well, that's not correct. They really do add up and they really do pay off. And in the final count, when we take the, the final weight of the model, it'll be nice to know that we're not carrying around. I took out four grams of wood. We're not taking around, carrying around for all eternity, one eighth of an ounce of nothing inside of a scoop. I'll get some finish on this now off camera. Now I'm going to sand out all this yellow paint that might, uh... by the way, this is just another th a thought. Whenever you want to test your paint, and we were testing the paint mixture, we put some extra pigment in the paint. Do it on a part, a small part like this, a flap, an elevator, and just sand it off. Now this, this paint will actually act as a, uh, you know, a filler, and it's been drying for a couple of weeks, so it'll make a real good filler. And it really doesn't matter what you make the substrate out of. Yellow paint is just as good as anything else. As long as you get it sanded back down nice. And we'll get all of this off. Because we still don't know what color we're going to paint the plane. There are so many Spitfire paint jobs that it's, uh, it's unbelievable. And I really haven't even put a lot of thought into the final color. I thought of doing a camo with the yellow bottom. And Steve DeJulia doesn't like that, so maybe I can't do that. I don't know yet. But anyway, any paint you can put on, you certainly can sand off. These are ready for another coat of silver. I think I'll get outside and get these painted before it starts snowing. The predicted snow today, just, just what I need. Anything to make my life a little easier. Yeah? Okay, radiators are back in silver. Now this is in today's mail and I thought this was just awesome. This is Chuck Potts of Mobile, Alabama. He has a Dynajet stunner that he says is from the 50s. And I'm just getting ready to send these pictures into Stunt News. I wanted to get them on the tape. He said in a real nice letter he loves K&B motors and, and all the things relating to uh, old time stunt. And he thought uh, he'd send me some pictures of his Dynajet stunner. Is this awesome? Now anybody goes back will remember it, like the 1960 Nats or so, a guy had a Dynajet stunner and it was the coolest thing. You know, all that stuff about refinishing and a refinish column, hey, this would be a great candidate for a refinish job here. Sick and tired of that tune pipe controversy. What's better, a Tiger 60 or a tune pipe? Forget it. Go with the Dynajet. Anyway, thanks to Chuck for the photos, and I will pass them on to Stunt News, as I always do. Now, one of the things I do from this point on, and I know this may sound like a little petty anti-bullshit thing, but it's really something significant. I take all the parts that are now in silver, and from the point that I'm joining the body to the wing, I really don't want to ever put this down on a flat table. This is a padded double blanket 
fuzzy old blanket. Save all your old blankets. This is the only real way to protect it. Otherwise, you're constantly doing this repair thing. Now, when I put the parts over on the table here before, I noticed, oh man, there's about seven or eight little dings in them. You know what? People have been over at the house. They've been touching things. So now from this point on, we go into uh, what I hope is going to be a little bit more careful, protected mode. Let's hope. <laughs> Maybe not. See, this is the kind of thing I'm trying to protect against. And this is from having 20 or 30 people at a time over here. Everybody has to pick everything up and touch it and bite it and squeeze it and fondle it and everything. And there's probably about five or six of them in there that I can see already. So I want to go put the hard points for the radiators on the wing. But believe me, this is a great idea. Get your old blankets and from this point on, let the thing sit on a nice fuzzy soft table. Good investment. See, there's little dings even in the wing. Even in the wing, I get these little dings, and that's from not having it on a padded table, having people pick it all up and everything. Really aggravating, but there's not a lot you can do here. Now, when Joe sent me the raw radiators, he sent me this drawing with the dimensions of where they have to go in a wing and some little footnotes and all the little hardware that has to be put in the wing, so... That's what I'm going to work on for the rest of this day, is try to get the hard points on the radiators. Now these are the little, well, I'll call them the hard points, for lack of a better word, that Joe has provided that are going to go into the wing. Now, one of the things I'm going to do, I don't know if Joe didn't mention this, but I'm going to screw the screw in all the way and then back it out all the way so that once these are installed in the wing, I don't have to fight the friction of the wood and maybe rip them out again. In fact, I'll put them in two or three times just to make sure that, uh, you know, that I have a good bond. And then I'm going to seal the bottom of it off with some thick CA so that if any oil does get down in there, of course, if we're flying without the radiators, we won't need these, then I won't have to seal up and I can leave the screws off, in fact. Now I'm finally getting to use the new belt stand. Our first job with the belt sander. I want to take some of the little extra material off here. This tool really works nice, by the way. If your wife didn't get you a Christmas present, make her get you one. Now that'll get off a little bit of the extra material that's just going along for the ride. I'm not so sure we couldn't use shorter screws. These are half inch screws, we probably could use quarter inch screws eventually. And maybe even aluminum screws get a little more weight off. Now I'm using Joe's dimensions and I'm trying to, whoops, I'm trying to locate this right on the spot. 15 sixteenths back off the leading edge. Woofed a little bit on the cap strip, 15 sixteenths. I just want to put a mark down there. Now I <clears throat> have a sharpened piece of uh, brass tubing here. I want to put a little indentation. Make sure I'm centered and I'm not. Second choice. See, so you go back and forth till you get it just centered, just nice. Okay, that's the last one. That's good. Now I can just set this in there, and this is a press fit, of course. Get it exactly level, so it needs almost no sanding at all. Trying to get a nice smooth fit here, and I'll just CA it in. Now, I didn't even think of this, but it would be a good idea when I do the next one. Put a little bit of Vaseline or 3-in-1 oil or something on the screw. 
These are things you think about when you go through this a few times. Just let it kick off normally and we'll pull a screw out. Now the whole trick with any of these things is use this screw in place. Make sure I don't even think I can get this in. I can't get my finger in there anyway. With this screw in place, this will hold this in position while I line up the front hole. So what I'm doing, I'm using my 48 inch straight edge to line these up and make sure I have them at 90 degrees. And I just want to put the same dot. See, one bolt holding this in position, and I just have to mark this and repeat that dowel application. Actually, this is a pretty well-engineered thing. I have to give Joe credit. This, this looks like it'll work fine. And the object, again, is so we can put the radiators on and off as a trim feature, or if, God forbid, they don't work, it flies better without them, we'll leave them off. Like having wheel pants that you can take on and off. <laughs> By the way, the tubing cuts a perfect hole in you. This is really well-engineered, as always, from Adam Usco. You got to give Adam Usco credit. When he engineers something up, it really does work well. And this is always a good lesson learned. If you don't know about something you're trying, especially in the area of semi-scale planes, make it removable. Make it that you can take it off and put it back the way it should be. I checked the alignment with the ruler and it looks reasonable anyway. Of course they have to be parallel this way and I have all the screws in now to see that one isn't cocked one way or the other. And if they were I'd have to elongate the holes and get a final adjustment on But again, they're removable. We don't know for sure if they're going to work well or not, but having them removable makes it all possible. By the way, I had it. I had to cut an Allen wrench down just with a parting wheel just so I could get in at those scoops and tighten and loosen them. Good idea to do that ahead of time too. Uh, next thing I want to get is the cosmetic uh, little patch on here. I want to just block sand this down. Get a little filler on here and maybe another coat of silver. See how much we need to get this. Shouldn't take much. It's relatively level now, but even if it isn't, get this level. Because if we're going to fly without the radiators, I don't want to have a lump here, that's for sure. Now I block sanded this down till they were relatively smooth. And of course, I'll hit it with some filler now. Let it dry while I'm having lunch and come back and maybe even get a coat of silver on this today. And we'll be getting ready for tomorrow. Now the trick is just get the minimum brush strokes on here just to fill it in. We'll let this dry while we're having lunch. <clears throat> Craig should be home by now. I can get this sanded and maybe even get a little more silver on it. I like to get I like to always do this kind of work in an ongoing way. If you wait till the end of building a plane to do all the little touch-ups, boy, it's a nightmare. If you do a little bit each day, a little bit each time, every time I see a little flaw here, in fact I would have fixed that one in the wing while I'm doing this. It just makes it so much easier. So that once that wing goes in a body in silver. I can also get a little coat of filler on this scoop while I'm waiting. Just let this, as I have the filler out, of course try to get whatever you need to do as far as filler coat goes. I have the, the nitro, the green nitro stain out, any little spots that need to be filled. One right after another. Try to do it in sequence.
Now with all this stuff dry, just taking the M600 and some 600 sandpaper. Remember those little dots, those little uh, imperfections that were in here? Well, see once this stuff dries up, how nice it sands out. We may be able to get a little coat of silver on this this afternoon, I hope. I'll get a close-up on this and see how nice and smooth that really comes out. No, you can't. You can't even feel that if you close your eyes. That is perfect. Those are the little dings when I showed them up earlier. These guys have disappeared into the the last coat of filler. We're gonna get some silver on that, and I'm sure once we put some silver on here, you'll see they'll be. It'll look terrible. Anyway, we're ready to put some silver on here. <laughs> I haven't looked outside all day, but I just opened the back door. I was going to walk out there and spray, and it's snowing again. So the hell with that. I'll have to spray inside. This is really a pain in the ass. These are the kind of things you can't predict ahead of time. What a pain in the ass. Unbelievable. Now I can <clears throat> I can just hear Karen when she comes home today. Anybody out there have a wife that doesn't like the smell of paint? Ah, you have been spraying in the house! Ah! And I'll sit with a straight face and say, oh no, honey. No, no, no. You must smell it. It must have come in through the window. Boy, if she ever saw these videos, good thing she never watches them. Now I just want to get some of this on because it'll be really like a filler coat. And I'll probably sand this out and get one more coat on before we get the wing and the body. Yeah, I can hear Karen now. Oh, no, you've been spraying in the house. Oh, no. Karen, trust me, I wasn't spraying in the house today. Oh. Would I do that, honey? Oh, no. I want to get just get plenty of material on here because I'm pretty much going to sand this down. Yeah, seriously, though, you have to, you have to give the women a break. They really do put up with a lot of bullshit, the truth. Especially my wife. <laughs> She's used to it. It's a way of life. I'll tell you, with the look of the snow out there, I'm guessing, you know, you can tell I'm not a good businessman. I should have bought a snow plow instead of new VCRs this year. Forget it. Could have been a millionaire. See, this is one of the things I do to try to get the smell out of here. I get the shop back in the door. You can see what an ordeal this is because it really does stink up the house. And out there is a beautiful snow falling. Oh man. If I would have only bought a snow plow, Midgley, send me a snow plow. Man, I could have been wealthy. I could have been somebody. I could have had more money than Randy Smith if I would have had a snow plow this year. Holy mackerel. I got this sanded out one more time here and it's almost ready. I got another coat of silver on there. That's drying up and what I'm going to do the little bit of time that's left. I want to get the table ready, get it all cleaned up and everything and ready to start putting that wing in the body tomorrow. Now before I do anything as far as putting a wing in the body of any plane, and I'm not going to do it today, I'm going to do it tomorrow. I get to really try to get as much preparation into this as I possibly can. This is really not something I can rush. I try to get the table as clean as possible. I've got the table shimmed. I did that off camera. We've done that enough times. I try to get all these little blobs of glue off and dope and everything. 
I want to start with a clean table so I can use that again as I did in that little dissertation to reference up. So with the table clean I want to go get the body and start laying this out and then tomorrow when I come down here I'll at least have some part of this ready to go. Now I always give the top edge of this fuse just a little bit of a kiss with the sanding block and leave the dust on. The nose ring has to hang off the edge of the table so what I try to do is reference off of one of my straight lines here and it looks like I have one and then I'll tack, I want to make sure this is in the right position, tack glue this whole thing down. See now my glass table has these lines etched in it but if you didn't have those it would be an easy enough thing to do to, to strike a center line down the table either with a piece of tape or with a, you know, a crayon or anything really. Now I want to make sure I'm level I don't have any sliding gaps up in here. Everything's nice and level. The nose ring hangs off the table. Everything else is nice and straight. And then I'm straight right down here. And now what I'll do is I'll just tack it about every six inches. And that fuse will be ready to, uh, to cut that center section out. And we'll be just kind of getting ready for tomorrow. So I'll get a little bit of a head start in case tomorrow is a snow. It, it is definitely going to be. Now I try not to put any glue directly underneath the wing if I can help it. There's an obvious reason for that is I have to break this off the table and that inhibits doing that. You might see a big chunk right here. There's a chunk of glass missing. and I had one of the crutches glued to the table so solid that when I broke it up, it pulled up the, broke the glass. Once I get one side down, usually the other side sits right out there. And I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not really skimping here on the glue because it's easy enough to cut it away. And even if you break it at that edge up a little bit by now, it doesn't even matter. I try not to get any glue underneath the wing. Put plenty up on the nose. Alright, that's good and solid now. Now if you don't feel like making one of these little alignment sliders, Walt Russell made me this one. It's kind of a, you can figure out yourself how it works. It would be easy enough to just take two pieces of balsa wood and glue on the, the, uh, the blade for the, the height that you need. It doesn't really matter. This is kind of a little uh, exotic way of doing it, but if you were to make one of these up, and I'd suggest you do, this, this lasts a lifetime, of course. Now remember we ran a scribed line on the fuselage side. It goes right through the center of the airfoil. We have it on both sides, of course. So now the question is, and I, I'm just guessing, I'm trying to do this through the macro lens, so just give me a little bit of a break. If I go here and I'm sliding this along a flat table holding it down solid, I can see that I have this if I just check it at various points and I move up here and I do the same thing on the other side. I know I've established the wing center line in relation to the flat table. Remember that thing on the beginning of the video. It's really really important and I have a complete parallel line now on both sides of the fuselage so now when I go to drop the wing in I want to drop the wing in and line this up with the middle of the trailing edge and on the front on the leading edge Joe has sunk a toothpick in on the center line I have to sand through the silver paint pick up the toothpick and put a line on there so that I can then connect the lines I'm going to saw this piece of the body off again I'm going to angle it both ways knock out all these formers cut this piece right out and Tomorrow I'll be ready to drop that wing right in here. And if I check this at several stations, you can see the lines are on there relatively accurately. I checked both. I checked this side already. Now the idea here is I want to cut this on about a 30 degree angle back again it's not a real critical thing 
And I also want to keep, I don't want the knife to go in at a 90 degree angle, I want it on a 30 or so degree angle. So I'm just doing this, just picking a random spot here off center. The idea of doing this with a with an, the blade like this is it takes out just enough material that when you're done you can put a 32nd inch piece of wood in there and it fills in the gap perfectly. Okay, we're through. Of course up here, you'd be cutting through the plywood so it just takes a little more, a little more, but I'm keeping that there. And we don't need any of these formers anymore, I'm just knocking them out of position. Don't have to be fancy here or anything, just get rid of them. <clears throat> now with all those formers removed, I'm just cleaning up all the little rough edges in there. Formers have done their job. See on a macro lens, you can see with that the zona saw cut angled, you have a lot more surface area. And you can see up here, I've chipped out the corner, but it's not a problem. We'll shove a piece right back in it, but it, the cut is on an angle. See if we can zero down on this. This is really a significant thing. That's what makes it all very efficient. Keep that on an angle and keep this on an angle. That's that's the whole ticket. Okay, with all those formers gone. I'll clean up, I'll just get rid of them on this other piece off camera, and we'll have this guy ready to, uh, <laughs> ready, hey, I'm almost ready. I've been ready for a long time. Now, the object of all this was to get set up for tomorrow, and we're in really good shape. There's only one problem, a small problem that we anticipated, so it's not really a big problem. We really do have a big snowstorm out there, so. I'm not even going to finish this tonight. I'm going to get out there with the snowblower and uh, do my thing. See you in the morning, I hope. Not a nice thing about coming down here and ha <coughs> having this all done. You guessed it. Six inches of snow last night and the snowblower dies, so i got to go buy a snowblower today. Anyway, I just want to do a little test fit here, make sure everything it's just what I had left it and step one is going to be to go over and get that wing off the rack make sure it's dried up this will be fine make sure the wing is dried up and get a center line on it get that started today the whole idea here and I wanted to I guess I've mentioned this but I, to do it again is even though today is not a great day because I have the distraction of having to go out and shovel snow and buy a snowblower what I'm going to try to do is get the wing in a saddle with the epoxy and while the epoxy is drying go get the snow blower so that'll kind of uh, fill in the day and when I get back it'll be an hour so that it should be nice and hard and I'll, I really won't lose any time but again a little time management here goes a long way I've been real careful about trying to keep everything down on blankets here and not get this all nicked up again all the little hard points are dry I want to get this right in the center of this wing Joe has a toothpick so I'm going to take some wet and dry paper and just clean out the silver in the middle of the fuselage find the toothpick and then establish my center line with the big ruler right across here I only need to go out about two inches on each side and all that's going to be is so I have an alignment mark to line up with the edge of the fuselage when it's time to line that up now you can see when I sand it away to paint you can see the little where Joe has left the toothpick sticking through. Now I can pick this up with my 48 inch ruler and get a center, an accurate center line. On a built up wing there's really no other way to pick up the center line that I know of other than if you get the center ribs with a toothpick in them, it really preserves that center line all through the building. Now <clears throat> believe it or not, I this this pen that, uh, <laughs> that John English sent in was the only thing that wanted to write on that silver paint nice so I actually did get some use out of it now I'm ready to take this wing and start laying it in the body and seeing just how much it is I have to cut up to get it mounted in there
But you can see that line I've got on it. That, that John English pen really writes on there well. I, I had trouble with it before, but I have to admit it wrote on there well now. Now, I always put a towel down right on the glass table a little bit away from the body. The reason for that is if the wing happens to tip that way, I don't want it to hit the uh, sharp edge of the glass or the piece of sanding belt or anything. I like to protect this. Again, I'm trying to be real careful and not get this all dinged up in the process. Now, I got an accurate 90 degree line right on the wing and exactly the midpoint. Scribe that on with that John English pen and now I want to do the same thing to the body here Before I assemble it. Let me get this on the macro lens. I Want to make sure I have exactly Right in the center and I'll just double check This will now be the center that I want to line up on now. I want to get a 90 degree line down here so I have a center line right down the whole former. This helps keep the middle of the wing right in the middle of that former. Now with that center line, I'll be able to accurately, hopefully and accurately get this center in and I have the same thing I'm going to do in the back. I use the horn as the reference in the back. So I have a center line here, a center line here. I can get it lined up in all the planes at once. Now I drop this wing in for the first time. And I'm looking for any spots where it's rubbing. Now believe it or not, depending on how accurate the plans you've cut from and how accurate your sides are, it will determine how much work it's going to be to get the wing in here accurately. I want to line up all these lines, line up the center line, line up the horn with the middle so that my fillets are equal here and make sure I'm equal in the back. I'm right in the center of the wing. Now, one of the things I have to give Adam Usko credit for, believe me, one of the things I would love to do if I was a s kind of scammy about this I do all this off camera, get it all perfect, drop it in, and then go, ha ha, mine lines up, how come yours doesn't? Well, let me tell you, the truth is, I have had wings that take all day to get in, and they, they, the, the hole doesn't match the wing for some reason, or the fuselage is a little bit cocked, or this way. This one looks like it's dead nuts on, with almost no prodding, uh, and I attribute that to Adam Usko, the accuracy to which he made all these patterns and templates. So the trick is if, if Martens, and of course he will have this all in the plans, when he has this all documented, you should be able to build right off the plans. Now, I'm really amazed this actually lines up so good, it's, it's ridiculous. It's going to take, a, I'm a little bit high up here. A couple of swipes of the sandpaper and I'll have this done. This, by the way, is very unusual. Usually this is uh, a little more labor intensive. I need to dress one side off here and that's it. I'm only high on this one side, and I think what I do, I have a blob of hot stuff there. Again, when you're going for this fit, this usually will take, I have that sandpaper glued to a the piece of aluminum tubing. It's better to just take little ice shavings off, little by little by little by little, get it right. The tighter you can make the fit, of course, the better. But if you can't, you can always fill in the gouges, so it's really not a problem either way. And I've had these where it takes, this is why I always allow a whole day for this, it, it takes all day to get this done, and it looks like this one is going to be on the easy side. But either way, we won't have a snowblower, I won't even think about it, till this wing is sitting here in wet epoxy. And this may take a little time, but doesn't really matter. The idea here is to get it right, not to get it done, not having a race. Now with lining up all the center lines here, now I can just walk around and see I'm still a little high. This side now is perfect and this side is a little. You need to take one or two more swipes with the paper on this side and I'll have it. 
getting one or two more swipes here and I, I'm real close to having it right here in the front. At the same time I want to make sure I'm staying in alignment here and keeping a horn, keeping my two fillets completely the same and I'll make little shims for them just to make sure this doesn't wander back and forth. Again this was a surprisingly accurate one. If it wasn't I would be going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth and just taking a little ice shaving and that's why I leave all the parts oversized. So a couple little sandpaper swipes and it sinks right down. As soon as it's level now we'll go to the back, do the same thing to the back. It's really a no-brainer to, to figure this out. You want to look down the table and see if the center line goes into the middle of the wing. Kind of a little awkward doing this, but... And just take away all the hard spots, just like doing sheetrock work, until that thing just drops, drops, drops right into position. When it's accurate, I want to float some slow-drying epoxy in there, put some weights on it, and let this sit. And actually, while this sits, I can go get that snowblower. I just thought I'd mention, well, when you're trying to grind away the plywood, it's, a, it's really handy to uh, take a couple of cuts with the Dremel and then dress it off with a piece of sandpaper. Again, I really want to have a nice fit here. I don't want to have a sloppy fit. I'm trying to get it. And I'm just taking the slightest amount off here. I'm taking like the thickness of a piece of paper off each time. Go back and fit it. Now, in this case, what was happening the wing was picking up on a high spot and it was rocking. When I'd get the back right, the front wouldn't be right. And when the front was right, the back wouldn't be right. It was rocking. So I've been constantly taking off little ice shavings in the middle to get it to just sit in one spot. Now I've gone just a little bit too far on one side and I'm going to make up a 32nd inch shim. Just right behind the horn, I've gotten it a little too thin. So it is really not a big deal, and it's a good thing this happened because I can, that's one thing I can put on the video. I really do want that wing to just sit right in there now, where this is going to go right down here. I just need a, an inch or so of this, but I'll put a little extra piece in it and feather it in. And it's always better to just have a little bit extra and then sand it down so you get that nice fit. Again, if you've seen how this goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, well, to get that accurate alignment, you know, it really does take a little time. And this is actually a real good one. Some of the bad ones that I've had, boy, when I did the arowana, I think it took a weekend. Everything was so sloppy, and then I didn't get it in right, I got frustrated. That's why I always allow a full day for this, and I really wish it was a better day outside, but now I have that built up a little bit. What was everything was lined up perfect here except this one was just a little down. So now by building that up, I hope I'm going to be able to just drop that right in there. Again, with that slow drying epoxy, I'll have plenty of time to get all the lines just right. I just remember how many times I'd, uh, you know, build a nobler back in the good old days when I was 10 years old or something. And where the hole was in a wing, that's where the wing was. And if it wasn't accurate, pull out of the wing over and, oh, man. You'll always know if you have this right by how the plane flies in inverted flight. 
and usually on a hard pull out, a wing over or a triangle. Oh, right on the money. Oh, my midgley would even be impressed. Now, I always like using the epoxy. It dries the slowest here. I don't have any of the two hour, but I do have the 45 minute. Well, one tube is bigger than the other. Now, there's an advantage to using a 45 minute that may not be obvious. It's very sandable when it dries. So if a little blob runs down the side of the body or inside or whatever, it's always very easy to, uh, you know, to take advantage of that and just sand it right off. Again, you want to have some time to babysit the wing. The whole idea here is you wouldn't want to put this in with five minute and, and it, oh man, it's, it's a little crooked. Oh, I didn't notice that before. Oh no. You know, a little time spent here is a really good investment. Always get the epoxy mixed to where it's a very pearly consistency. And in this case, we're going to leave it thick. No heat at all. Just let it glob right on. Now again, I like to get a nice, a nice bead on here, but I don't want to have four gallons of it drooling down the side of the body, if possible. Another good thing about the epoxy, it fills in gaps real nice. So just, I have 15 minutes to work with this. I'm just going to dress on and get a nice bead on the whole fuselage side, this whole area. You know one thing's for sure, if you have slow dry and epoxy, you're not going to have a problem. As soon as you put five minutes here, about three minutes into it, you'll realize, ah, I got to go, ah, ah. That's the, definitely the way it works. I'll always take a little alcohol at the end and wipe this edge, so I try to have the minimum dripping down the body if I possibly can. I like to have one nice bead right along there. Now, of course, the big key is... <laughs> Believe me, I did this pretty, I, even I'm impressed, is to drop it into the epoxy, line it up, line it up, line it up, and drop it in, not to get it in and then go <coughs> and spread it all over. You know, I, I really did do this pretty accurately. Now I want to line up every one of the lines. I have center to center, front to front, back to back, and side to side. When all of those lines are in alignment, I'll put a weight here and I'll babysit this. Usually until that epoxy in the, in the little puddle cures up. The idea of that is if this starts to move, I'm in trouble. Well, let me answer the phone. Now I got a little bit of alcohol in the Q-tips and while, while this is sitting here, it still hasn't started to kick. I'm trying to get as far under as I can with a wet Q-tip, an alcohol Q-tip, and just get any extra epoxy that's drooling around in there, even inside. All right, all that's left now is to babysit. Again, what I do, I leave this out. This tells me when the, when the stuff starts to kick off, it's still a little sticky. As soon as that's rock hard, I know I can, uh, you know, give it another half an hour and work on this. Now, because I have other things to do today, I really don't want to walk away from this until the epoxy hardens up. So what I'm going to do is babysit and walk around doing just what I'm doing right now on camera every about 10 minutes or so. Make sure all my lines are lined up. Again, that babysitting thing is a significant thing. All the lines line up. Make sure nobody hits the table. See, this is a great thing that nobody's over here now. If I had the bike gang over here or something, everything's lining up solid there, around the back. And again, a lot of people like to just rush on, but I want to make sure that between each fillet it's exactly the same, and I've measured that with the machinist ruler. And I'm just going to give this the babysit treatment here, give it 45 minutes or an hour here. Now I get emotional, uh, I don't know, I sit here watching this thing babysitting and I think, you know how lucky we are as a group to have so many talented and uh, fun people around. How nice it is that we have nationals and local contests to go to, concourse awards and the, the like. And how, you know, how nice it is, how nice it would have been had uh, this information been available on video when I was younger. Hey, I might have been, uh, I might have been somebody, you know, I could have been like, <laughs> like that champion fighter. I could have been somebody. Hey, Midgley, I could have been somebody. <laughs>
So, as I say, at the end of, you know, at the end of every one of these tapes, I hope you've gotten something worthwhile that'll make your appreciation and enjoyment of modeling a little, you know, a little happier. And encourage you to pass it on to people that still are at the bottom of the ladder and working their way up. Don't forget that.